not be man. Many moons ago, man controlled his destiny, his purpose, and his household. But today man has traded his control of the home for a different kind of control. This is what most men are in control of in their households. And for a lot of it, that's the extent. Today's society, we've forgotten what a godly man and a godly woman are. That's why we're talking about these for the next couple weeks. And uh, one of the problems that we have greatly is the fact that our society no longer recognizes the roles of men and women. We've adjusted, we've changed, we've modernized. And I don't necessarily know that that is good. Today's men, for the most part, are not in control. They are not in control of their households. They are not in control of their families. They are not in control of the spiritual culture that they are raising their children in. If you wanted to compare today's man with a lot of Bible characters, one of them that would stick out would be Ahab. And I'm not talking about Ahab the Arab, I'm talking about Ahab the king of Israel. <laughs> Ahab was a poor, poor, pitiful king because Ahab did not have control over his wife, Jezebel. Jezebel controlled him. Ahab was a whiny, little moping guy who would get depressed and Jezebel could make things happen. Today, a lot of men have become Ahabs. They've traded... They've traded control of their children, control of their family, control of their household for control of this. So they can come home from work and they can shut off the world. And I, I tell you, some of you women, some of you kids know, if daddy had an off button on you, he would shut you off before he turned this on. <laughs> and there's a lot of Ahabs walking around today. And, 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 and there's, there's problems. Men and women are different, and that's one of the things that it's really hard for us to understand. And, and because we're Ahabs, I'm going to tell you something about men, and I'm going to talk to women right now for a second. Men are not stupid. I didn't hear one man say amen. Maybe men are. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they are. Men are not stupid. They are, definitely. definitely. <laughs> Forget that whole point. I'm going to scratch that one out. Stake in congregations full of Ahabs. they got to elbow them before they even know what to say. Okay. Listen. Men are not stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your brother. See, that's what we need. Men are not stupid. They're just lazy. <laughs> But one of the problems with, with us being lazy is lazy translates into stupid. And I think it's, it's the way we get treated sometimes. If Einstein... Did Einstein have a wife? Two. He had yeah. two wives? Yeah. See, he burned through the first one real quick, obviously. I bet even Einstein's wife treated him like an idiot. Not because he was stupid. Because here's this guy who's got this brain of just amazing. But I'm sure his wife probably said, Albert Einstein, clothes do not go on the floor. Do you know where the hamper is? <laughs> you see, when women get mad at us, they talk to us like we're stupid. Albert Einstein, you may be a brilliant scientist, but you should be smart enough to know that that trash bag isn't going to grow legs and evolve overnight and walk itself out to the garbage can. And one of the things that happens is when, when, we, when we hear that, we feel stupid. Guys don't like living with their mothers. And then they're like, hmm. And sometimes, sometimes it's not what, what's said to us as much as the way it's said, but that's a whole other problem because we don't communicate the same way. 
we communicate completely different. That doesn't even make sense. We communicate differently than one another. Listen to this. I can talk to my mom on the phone for a very long time. I, I shouldn't say that. I can listen to my mom on the phone <laughs> for a very long time. And it could be an hour, maybe an hour and a half sometimes. I hang up the phone. Nicole says, so what do you and your mom talk about? Nothing. <laughs> I condensed an hour and a half into nothing. But sometimes Nicole can get off the phone, and I can say, hey, what was the phone conversation about? Oh, you know, a long time ago there was this guy named Bob, and she's telling me this story. And it goes on and on and on. It's got all these different parts. This guy over here and that guy over there and this lady and she did this and said this to this and this person. And then what's that? And and you know, I'm just sitting there going, oh, okay. It takes 45 minutes to explain the phone call. <laughs> and the phone call lasted five. So we have a communication problem. How do we squeeze an hour and a half into one minute? And they squeeze 45 minutes out of five. <laughs> We're different people. And that's why, one of the things about men is, men and women can't communicate because women don't know how to communicate with men. If there's anything else going on but your voice, that's what they're paying attention to. <laughs> because Nicole can, Nicole can come to, I can be sitting in the living room, nothing happening, no TV, nothing in front of me. You know, don't try to talk to your husband while he's watching TV. Because what he's going to do is he's going to say yes to get you to shut up. And then you're going to have a fight down the road because he didn't know he gave you permission to do that. Talk to him when nothing else is going on. Because even, even little things like, Nicole could be saying, Troy, you know, I really need to talk to you about this because this is very important. We've got this thing, we've got this, and I was like, huh? you know, she's like, what do you think about that? And I looked up and I go, I, there's turkeys in the front. Of <laughs> I, heard, I heard turkey sounds. <laughs> All right away. Right away, <coughs> women get angry. Are you even listening to me? And usually we go, oh, I'm trying. I'm trying to listen. But we've gotten really good about shutting things off as men. We've gotten really good about shutting our wives off. We've gotten really good about shutting the kids off. We've gotten really good at, at not being a part of our families. Not taking a stand, not taking that part. And what happens is this. When you back out of your life and you decide to go hands-off, when you decide to go hands-on, the only thing you're going to be faced with isn't... Your, your wife's not going to go, Honey, you want to be involved now? Oh, that's wonderful! Let me go get my tiara. I've been waiting for this day. It's in a closet over here somewhere. Oh, I feel like a princess now. Yes. Tell me how we should run the family and the finances that I've been running by myself for the last 20 years. <laughs> That's what happens. And so a lot of us are in a, in a deep, deep chasm because we start that and we initiate that. And all of a sudden, here comes the boxy kangaroo. We're like, you know what? This is good. I'm cool. This is good. Ooh, check that out. That's awesome. Want some money? I got some money. <laughs> Godly men today are perishing and vanishing. <coughs> and part of the reason that we're vanishing is because we've allowed ourselves to vanish. We've allowed ourselves to be hands-off with the kids. We've allowed ourselves not to be as intimate with our wives as we need to be. We've allowed ourselves not to be conversationalists with one another. We've allowed ourselves to slip into this land of, as soon as I get home, I can't wait to get home to shut the family off. And we try to escape. And the problem is, we escape from the wrong thing. We escape from the people that we need to be loving, be involved with. And when you try to do that, when you try to get back to that, when you try to say, you know what, I haven't been the head of my household, I'm going to be the head of my household. <coughs> Your wife usually goes, well, we'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> because there's this resentment. And women, a lot, of, a lot of women that I've talked to said, I want my husband to be the head of the household. I want him to take a stand. I want him to be aggressive. I want him to make decisions. No, you don't. 
You may think that. But if you've been in control for a long time, if you've been making the decisions, you've got this freedom. And to, to, to be submissive to that idiot, you're going to have to give up that freedom. And a lot of, a lot of you have relegated the men into that idiot category because they're of no help to you. But they are a paycheck, and that's good. <coughs> but today we're going to look at what a godly man is. So that we can understand what it is to be a godly man. We'll bring it back around when we close. Number one, a godly man is a worker. A godly man is a worker. If your husband doesn't provide for his family, he's not a godly man. Now there are circumstances and there are situations in which you can't find work and you can't provide. And we're not talking about these circumstances. We're talking about a real man is going to be a worker. He's going to get a job. If he has to sacrifice his dignity and flip hamburgers at McDonald's just so that his family can have a roof over their heads, a real man will do that. I had a friend once who was, well, he was about my size. He was a little bigger, actually. And uh, he wouldn't work. He wouldn't leave the house, wouldn't go, wouldn't go anywhere. His wife was a nurse, and she got a pretty good income. But his, his in-laws were just about disgusted with him. They just couldn't stand the fact that he wouldn't work. So I went to him one day, and I said, why don't you work? Why don't you just go get a job? There's a job opening over here at the gas station. You could work there, and you could... Oh, you know, I'm waiting for a management position. Like, dude, you're never going to get one. Well, that's what I'm waiting for. A godly man doesn't care about his dignity. He puts his family first. He'll get in there and he'll work and he'll, he'll provide and he'll support and he'll do what needs to be done to take care of the family. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8 says, Servants, do what is ordered by those who are your natural masters having respect and fear for them with all your heart as to Christ. Not only under your master's eye as pleasers of men, but as servants of Christ, doing the pleasure of God from the heart, doing your work readily as to the Lord and not to men, in the knowledge that for every good thing anyone does, he will have a reward for the Lord if he is a servant or if he is free. Some advice Paul was given to servants, but also to men saying, do your work and do what, and do what you do is on to the Lord. You know, a lot of people think, well, my job is demeaning, and I hate this job, and I wish I had a better job. But if it helps you pay the bills, and if it's taking care of your family, rejoice in that job. And rather than look at it as tedious and, and hating it, saying, hey, this is a means by which I can provide. And this is from the Lord. And do it just like you were working directly for the Lord. Guess what? If you treat your bosses on the job as you would treat Christ, if you treat people around you on the job as you would treat Christ, if you are upstanding and upright, and if you work hard just like you were working, just like you were working your tailbone off for Christ, you will be rewarded. Not just by Christ, but I believe you're going to get a promotion. You're going to do better in your job if you'll if you'll take it seriously and if you'll if you'll work at it. You might start out flipping burgers, but the next thing you know, you might be managing a Wendy's. And that's a really good thing, because then you can eat the burgers that other people are flipping. Number two, a godly man is a leader. A godly man is a leader. You know, when God called you to serve Him, He was calling out a generation of priests. You know, if you're serving Christ, you're a priest in His kingdom. And one thing God wants you to be is God wants you to be that priest. He wants you to be that servant and He wants you to be that leader that He has called you to be. 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 15. And Paul is talking to Timothy, and he's basically saying, Hey, Timothy, look at my leadership. This is what I want you to do. I want you to model leadership to people like I've modeled it to you. Beginning with verse 10. But thou didst follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, long, suffering, love, patience, persecutions, and sufferings. What things before me befell me at Antioch and Iconum and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But abide thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and, and that from a babe, Thou hast known the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith 
which is in Christ Jesus. Basically, what Paul is saying is, abide in what you've been taught, abide in what I've taught you, abide in the example that you've seen, and don't just abide in it, but be it. One of the problems that we have in today's society is too many people are looking for examples instead of being examples. We should be leadership. We should be the examples that other people can look up to and go, hey, I want to be like that. Hopefully, as a godly man, when people look at you and they, they look at your relationship with your spouse or your relationship with your kids, hopefully you're the kind of example that when people look at you and go, man, I wish that I had a dad like that. I wish I had that kind of relationship with my son or my daughter. I wish I had that kind of relationship with my wife. As Christians, as people of God, as people who live by that book called the Holy Bible, we should be raising a standard. Not looking for one, but raising a standard in our community so that people could look up to us and go, that's what I want. That's what I want to be. A godly man is a leader. And he's a leader that people can look to and follow the example and not get his head. Number three, a godly man is a servant. You can't be a good leader unless you're a good servant. Because if you've never served, you don't know where to lead. If you've never served, you don't understand what it is to be leadership. You know, one of the things I feel really bad about, I feel really bad when I go into a, a restaurant or I go into a, a place where people basically live off tips. They get paid, but they, they make a lot of living off tips. I feel bad when I see like a big table full of people and they're eating and they get up and they walk away and they don't leave anything on. They just deserve it. It always makes me feel bad. And part of the reason it makes me feel bad is because of the fact that, that uh, you know, my salary is a percentage of income that comes from the offering in the church. And so in a sense, I'm like a spiritual waitress. <laughs> and when, when you're in that position yourself, you, you look at others in that same position and go, man, if I don't do something, nobody's going to do it. And you want to be more generous. You want to you give more. When you have been in a position of serving and you've depended on the kindness of others, then when you're in a position of leadership, you should show that same kind of generosity. A godly man being a servant is one who has been places, has done things, understands some of the areas that we've been in. You know, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all made mistakes. And the cool thing about a godly man is when you make a mistake in front of a godly man, he's not going to act superior to you. He's not going to go, How dare you get out of my sight, you foul worm. And if he does, he's not a very godly man. He's probably going to say, you know what? I know you're hurt and I've been there myself. He's probably going to offer to pray for you or to, to love you because we have to be servants. We have to be servants. You can't be leadership until you've been a servant. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. Jesus, however, called them to him and said, You are aware how those who are deemed rulers among the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men make them feel their authority. But it's not so among you. No, whoever desires to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever desires to be first among you must be the bondservant of all. For the Son of Man also did not come to be waited upon, but to wait on others, to give his life as a redemption price for the multitude of people. Jesus was saying, hey, I'm the King of glory, and I'm the Son of God. And do you know what I'm doing with my time down here? I'm serving. I'm serving you. Why am I serving you? Because serving you is the only way I can teach you leadership. And he was leading them and serving them at the same time. So leadership and servanthood, they walk hand in hand. If you can't be a servant and a leader, and you're in leadership, you're just a dictator. You're just telling people what to do, but not serving them. Number four. A godly man is a teacher. A godly man is a teacher. Now my father was a good man. I, Troy, coming from goodly parents, 
Truth declare, my father was a goodly man. He was a neat guy, but he wasn't an Einstein. Okay, we'll leave it at that. And so, when I would ask for help with my homework, my dad would say, here, let me see it. <coughs> we'll take this to your mother. <laughs> it was funny, because he always, he always wanted to help. But he always ended up directing me to mom. And I always dreaded that. Because my mother, she was, you know, when kids ask you for help on their homework, just take a lip, take a hint. They want you to do their homework for them. They don't want you to teach them something. Don't waste your time trying to teach your kids something. That's what school's for, right? That's a godly parent policy. So. But usually, usually kids, kids want, okay, help me find the answer to this problem. And so what my mom would do is, okay, I'll help you find the answer. You took train A from point B at 350 miles. Now don't read me the question. I can read the question by myself. How do I figure this out? Okay. You took train A from... Yeah! And usually mom and I would always end up having a little, like, yelling match. <laughs> Dad would be like, oh, thank God I'm pretending I'm stupid. <laughs> but, but a godly man is a teacher. Wow. Teachers teach you things. Teachers will explain things to you. My father taught me how to plant plants. My father taught me how to ride a bike without training wheels. How do you do that? Go oh, pain. <laughs> Don't like the pain? Learn to balance. <laughs> so, but he taught me those things. My dad taught me how to swim. I remember when, when I was a little kid, my dad took me into a uh, he took me into a pool and, and he laid me on my belly and he said, okay, flap your arms, flap your feet, you know, move around and scream I'm drowning. And he told me, he taught me how to do that. You know? My dad taught me how to play catch. You know, he'd throw a ball out on the interstate and say, go, get it. <laughs> my dad taught me all kinds of things. And, and he did teach me the things that I needed to know as a young man growing up. You know, when, when, when it came time for me to have the talk, you know the talk about the birds and the bees? Why do they call it the birds and the bees? Shouldn't they call it the bees and the flowers? Or maybe the birds and the other birds? The male birds, the female, the birds and the bees. No, that's not right. Birds and bees don't do that. That would be some crazy bird bee flying around. That's just sick and wrong. But why do they do that? Most, most families that you go to, it's usually, it's usually mommies that sit down. Because dads are like nervous about that. I don't know. And, and I'm not because my dad was the guy who had to talk with me. He did. He sat me down one day and he said, Troy, I need to talk to you. And I'm going to tell you, I was so scared after that talk. <laughs> I didn't even want to wash properly. <laughs> my dad terrified me. He was like, and if you ever do this, and if I ever see this, and if I ever, I will kill you! <laughs> Dad, can I talk to Mom about this? <laughs> but the thing was, he was a man, and men, men shouldn't be afraid to talk about that with their kids. You know, if more men would get involved in stuff like that with their kids, we would have less problems down there. But I'm going to tell you why a lot of kids... A lot of kids are problems today because they do not fear their earthly father. And if you cannot fear your earthly father, you do not know how to fear your heavenly father. So don't try to take a bunch of kids that were raised with Ahabs and lead them to Jesus. Matter of fact, you might want to talk about Mary with them. Because they're going to have a hard time following Jesus if they didn't have somebody in their home. Who was an example of God again? That's why this is so important. A godly man is a teacher. Titus 2, 6 through 8 says, Encourage young men to use good judgment. Always set an example by doing good things. When you teach, be an example of moral purity and dignity. 
speak an accurate message that cannot be condemned. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed because they cannot say anything bad about us. You know, one of the enemy's biggest lies that he's got a lot of parents trapped in these days is, well, you can't tell your kids not to do anything you do. There's a lot of people out there that, that, that well, you know, I did this when I was young, and, and I, I kind of did that, and so I really, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to really tell it because I'd feel like a hypocrite if I did. Oh, and if you did tell them, you might feel like a parent. <laughs> You can buddy up with your kids all the way to hell if you want. But there comes a time when you have to be a mom and a dad. And sometimes mom and dads have to say no, and they have to put their foot down, and you have to do it right away, because then that kid gets the idea, hey, I'm kind of scared of you. And a lot of people say, oh, I never want my child to fear me. I never want my child to fear me. Trust me, honey, if your child never fears you, you're going to fear that child someday. If your child learns how to fear you, that child will learn how to fear God because they're going to understand the placing of authority. And as a, as a godly man, we need to have that kind of authority in our house, that kind of authority that you know, hey, Daddy loves you, but Daddy's going to break every bone in your body if you don't listen to him. Because <laughs> that's the kind of love daddies need to have sometimes. And when kids get that, we need to speak that accurate message. We don't need to condemn, but we need to speak a message of purity and of dignity. And we need to say, no, we're not going to stand for that. And we need to be godly men. And I'm going to tell you something, women. There's this resentment when a guy tries to step up to the plate. There's resentment when a guy tries to come forward and be a godly man. But you know what? If you can get past that and you can let him... Your life is going to get a lot easier. When you say to a kid, wait until your dad gets home, that kid's going to... <laughs> They're going to start going on this little, little you know, they, they become a little like bribesters after that happens. No! I'll, I'll give you all my candy! It's like, oh, you're fat. You must want to eat all the time. Here, have some ice cream. And he'd always go, he'd always go, okay, Troy, this sounds really good. Thank you so much. I'm not going to tell mommy about this, though. <laughs> That's when we begin to enjoy the thing we call second supper. Oh, it's wonderful. But, but Dad was the kind of guy who, who used, to, uh, used to teach me kind of sneaky things like that. But I always had that fear of him. And when my mom said, wait till your dad gets home, I knew when my dad got home, I was in trouble. And there was that fear. And it taught, it teaches a kid, this is what this teaches a kid. A lot of people go, why aren't you just putting a kid on a hot seat, making him unnecessarily nervous for a long, long time, until his dad gets home, and then he, he dreads that. But at the same time, too, it teaches them actions have consequences. And that there's always going to be somebody who's going to deal those consequences, too. Number five, my last point. A godly man is a gentleman. A godly man is a gentleman. You know, one of the things today that, that you don't see a lot of, and, and you don't see it in the world that much, you don't see guys opening doors, or scooting out chairs, or, or, or letting their wives, you know, eat first. Uh, we went to uh, went up to North Dakota when we were in Elgin, and there was a couple of the older German families that they had some teenage boys, 
And the boys would come to the table, and when they would come to the table, they would stand until all the women had been seated. They wouldn't sit down until then, and then they'd sit themselves down. <clears throat> That's called respect. That's called chivalry. It's called treating others better than yourself and keeping in mind that when you do that, you're treating the people that you love, the women that you love, you're putting them on a pedestal. And that's a good thing. Because a lot of women today don't get treated this way. They feel equal in the right that, hey, who cares about you? You don't care about me. I just do whatever I want. Because of that, there's a lot of tension in relationships today. I talked to a lady the other day on the phone. She was talking about reading scriptures, and uh, she asked if I'd read some scripture for her, and I said, yeah, sure, I can do this, and she wanted me to tape it and send it to her. And uh, she said, what I'm going for, she said, well, if, if you could, could you wear a suit when you read it? And, and just be very serious about this. And I said, yeah. And she knows me. She's like, she's scared. Every, be very serious, please. <laughs> Don't do this, Gooby. <laughs> Don't read in a weird voice. <laughs> she said, let me tell you what I'm trying to go for. She said, I'm trying to go for something that our society and culture have completely lost when it comes to God. And I said, what's that? She said, reverence. And I thought about that after she said that because I thought, you know, that's true. We've lost a lot of reverence, a lot of respect. And, and one thing that a gentleman exudes from him is reverence. He has reverence for God. He has reverence for others. He has reverence for those around him. And a godly man is a gentleman. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20-26, it says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood, of earth, and some unto honor and some unto dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work, after righteousness, faith, love, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and arrogant <coughs> questionings refuse, knowing they gender strifes. And the Lord's servant must not strive, but be gentle towards all, apt to teach, forbearing in meekness, correcting them that oppose themselves, if peradventure God may give them repentance unto the knowledge of truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him unto his will. Now basically what this is saying is, men, if you will say to God, Lord, I made mistakes in my life. God, I've done some things that are wrong. Lord, I've, I've overlooked some things. Father, I've not been involved like I need to be, but I want to be a vessel for you. I don't want to be concerned about making sure that I get to take that special hunting trip this year, and that's the only thing I worry about. I don't want to be concerned about money all the time and making sure that, oh, we've got lots of money, money, and money, and miss raising and loving and being with my family. I don't want to be so caught up in anger and in stress and in, in all these things going on that I lose the love that I have for my spouse and my children. God, I want to be a vessel of honor so that you can use me. And the promise in the scripture is if we'll purify our hearts, if we'll come before Him, if we'll say, God, use me for your purpose, the more we do that, the more and more and more of His purpose He will pour into us. It's a promise. So a godly man's a worker, a leader, a servant, a teacher, and a gentleman. My question to you today is, are you a godly man? If you're a woman, you don't have to say yes. <laughs> If you're a child, you don't have to say yes. Hopefully if you're a man-child, you'll say, I'm where I want to be. <laughs> My question is, are you a godly man? Do you exude these things in your life? Do you live these things? Do people see Christ in you? And if not, my call today is, come and follow Him. Lay down your nets and follow Jesus. Forget about the stress of home. 
and the work and these things that you keep striving to do and just become a vessel that God can flow through. And all of a sudden, you'll see the pieces come back together when God is shown through you. Are you a godly man? And women, my question to you is this. What are you doing in your homes to promote godly men? Are you allowing your husband to be the man of God that you desire, or are you stopping him from being the man of God? Because that would be too much control. When he stands up and says, things are going to change, do you go, well, praise God, honey, I'm with you. Or do you go, ha, 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 I heard that before. <laughs> yeah, right. Try it, Ahab. I got the checkbook in one hand and the car keys in another. Where are you at with him being a godly man? Or is he just another kid you're raising? And leaves his clothes on the floor. Don't know how to take out the trash. Just a checkbook coming home. Just a check from work. What are you doing to make sure that the man you're married to is a godly man? If he started making the decisions that you wish he'd make, will you stand behind him? Or will you get in front of him? What are you going to do? Because if your man's here today and God's working on his heart, and he decides, hey, I'm going to change, and you go home and he just meets up with aggression, <coughs> it's not going to take too long before. This is back in the hand. Please, take me away. Be that encouragement that he needs to be a godly man. Be his cheerleader. Tell him that you believe in him. And together, work on that thing that can take you to eternity. As a family. As a committed couple. Let's bow our heads. Father God, right now, in Jesus' name, I just pray that you will raise up godly men. Lord, forgive me for the things in my life that are ungodly. Forgive me for the times when I haven't taken a stand, Lord. Forgive me for the things that I've said that haven't been very gentlemanly. God, in my heart, I want to be a godly man. Lord, I want to be like you. Father, I pray that the prayer of every man in this service right now would be Help us to be like you. Help us to love you and serve you. To treat our wives as we would treat you. To treat our kids as we would treat you. To treat our work and our bosses as we would treat you, God. Make us godly men, because that's what this world needs. The godly man is disappearing. Father, we're saving so many animals that are becoming extinct. But we're losing godly men. Lord, I pray that our priority would be to save the man of God. That we would begin to see him in our lives. That we would begin to glorify you like never before. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all for coming today because you each bring something unique. Your body temperature. It's at the inner core of the church. Hallelujah. Well, what we're going to do is, as Nicole said, if it's chilly out, guys, don't take them out by dedicated inside because people don't like chilly. Why do you make them chilly every week? Um,